Good afternoon, everybody. I want to talk to you today about building products with empathy and also hopefully help you get through the food coma for the next however many minutes I'll be talking about this. So just to give you a brief background on myself, I originally come from the music industry and uh, transitioned into front-end development, became a software engineer before finding my way into product management, which I absolutely love every day of at Dollar Shave Club. And while it's really easy to get into the, the normal process of, of building products, um, there's a, a project that I've been working on recently where I've been experimenting with a new, new process that I've been calling Building with Empathy. And it's been an experiment. It's still a work in process, but I wanted to share some of it with you today. So to start, we need to talk a little bit, a little bit about the MVP. So raise your hands if you've seen this before. OK, about half of you. So for those of you who have not seen this diagram before, this illustrates how to phase out a product. So let's say our high level requirement, our user need, is mobility, transportation. The top way, which is the wrong way to do this, is phase one, the MVP, is just the wheel. And that's not really going to provide the user with the value that they need. A wheel is just the wheel. You're not going to be able to get around with this unless you have extremely good balance. Uh, phase two, you've got two wheels so on and so forth until you get to the fourth phase where you finally have a car and you finally deliver on the customer value you've been trying to deliver this whole time. This is bad. We do not want to build products this way. Um, down below, it <clears throat> shows how you can build products with the user value in mind from the very beginning, phase one. Phase one, while not a car, is a skateboard. And what this does is it provides the customer value, their, their requirement of mobility, from the very beginning. And it may not have all the bells and whistles, but what you've put out there is going to satisfy those needs. And that's going to be a successful product, hopefully. Over the next few phases, you're going to refine and polish and ultimately get to your, your end result of a car. And in this case, they even took it a step further, and it's a convertible. Not bad. How many of you have seen a chart like this? OK, fewer. So this is the same thing, but it's a slightly different take on how to build an MVP. At Dollar Shave Club, a lot of what we do um, is, is tied to the emotional value and, and the usability of a feature or product or whatever it is we're offering, as well as the functionality. So while the previous diagram is really good at showing how to build in terms of functionality to satisfy our customer requirement, this states that in order to build an MVP, which is the dark red section of your ideal product, it needs to also be usable and delightful. And because of our work at Dollar Shave Club, it compels us to build products in this way so that we're not purely building functionality, but we're also building products that are delightful for customers to use. And that requires, in my mind, building with empathy. So to kind of go back to the basics here, uh, what is empathy? So empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another, literally defined. Um, in this case, we need to be able to empathize with a customer's needs in order to build a successful product, something that's going to satisfy their requirements. But I would say that it goes even farther than that, in that empathy needs to be fostered with the working team as well, the squad that consists of the engineers, the designers, the product manager, the stakeholder. They all need to be able to empathize with the customer, but they also need to be able to empathize with each other. So what I've illustrated here is kind of the unempathetic way of building a product. A stakeholder has a KPI, a requirement, an idea, and they work with the product manager, and the product manager takes these ideas and then maybe works with the designer or the lead engineer comes back with a whole set of requirements. And then they go over to the team and they tell the team what to build. Again, I stress this is an unempathetic way in that the squad is only interacting with the product manager, and the stakeholder is only interacting with the product manager. And um, you don't have a sense of empathy between them. How many times has it come up where you've heard questions, why are we doing this? Or deadlines are purely arbitrary. Or uh, the one that I love is when the stakeholder says, can't you just make your engineers work faster? It, it, does, it doesn't work that way, right? Um, that's coming from a lack of empathy within the team. And even though the squad and the stakeholder and the PM might understand what the customer needs are, they're not working in sync. 
And so when you actually have a team that has empathy with each other as well as the customer requirements, you end up with something like this. And to get to this system or this way of working, to me the most important point is that the role of the product manager is not to tell your team what to do. The product manager needs to act as a catalyst to empower and inspire your teams to do their best work, to provide customer success, and hopefully release an MVP or a final product that's going to measure up to what the customer's needs really are. So how do we get there? How do we build with empathy? How do we take those previous diagrams, which are good at telling you what you should do, how you should build out functionality, or what needs to comprise an MVP, and actually take your requirements or your idea and actually release that, um, maybe with some tight deadlines or hard requirements or whatever other circumstances come up, as they always do. So we tried a new process. And as I said, this is an experiment, still a work in progress, but we kicked off the project with a project charter. Some of you might be familiar with this. Some of you might not be. I, I was not. This was a new thing to me. And what we do in the project charter, and this is actually the real charter that, that we did with, with the project that we're working on right now, that this is all based off of, we had all of our engineers from the squad, and our squads are generally a little smaller, maybe six engineers. Uh, we had our QA engineers. We had design. We had product. Uh, we even had product outside of the team in other areas of the business. And most importantly, we also had the stakeholder. And in this case, the stakeholder is our VP of what we call member strategy and monetization, which is our, our CRM team. And in this session, we asked ourselves a bunch of questions as a group. Why are we doing this? And this one to me is really key, that everybody in the group can ask this to each other. The stakeholder can actually provide an answer directly to the engineers. The product manager is no longer the conduit in which this information must pass, but the engineers can get real understanding from the stakeholder. In this case, our project is deadline driven. Um, it's something that we don't really have control over. And there are KPIs that we are expected to meet. I mean, this is the reality of, of doing business, right? So the engineers are able to ask the stakeholder. The stakeholder can explain, and they understand. Um, what are the KPIs driving this project? Or even better, what does success look like? And that's something that I feel is also really important to ask, because depending on who you ask, success is going to look like different things. If you ask an engineer what success looks like, they might say that there's a ton of legacy code that they want to scrub out of the system, or there are areas that they want to refactor because parts of the code base are not functioning as well as they could, and it's taking them a lot longer to build things than it really needs to. A stakeholder might say that success looks like hitting our KPIs. A product manager um, could have you know, many different reasons for success. Maybe it's making the team happy, it's hitting the KPIs, making the stakeholder happy, um, so on and so forth. And we went through a whole bunch of questions. Another one that I felt was really important, what are the risks and dependencies? So the engineers can also have a chance to communicate to the stakeholders, hey, this is a deadline. You're asking us to deliver this project by a certain date. Well, here are the things that are potentially going to slow us down. And the stakeholder can actually, they can ask questions. They can rebut that if they want. Or you know, in a lot of cases, they, they end up with the understanding of, OK, we, we understand that this is what we're asking. And we know that this is, these are the challenges we're going to face. So now everybody is kind of aligned and bought in on how we can help get to this deadline and mitigate any of these risks. So this was a, was a huge, huge, huge step for us and the way we work and really helping develop empathy with the team from the get-go before a single wireframe is drawn or a line of code is written. And so we took all these, all these points that we talked about and we put them up on a window, beautiful mind style, almost. And we categorized them. And these are points from all the engineers, or the stakeholders, or the product people. So we took all these ideas and synthesized them digitally. I drew up a matrix. You know, I um, got this in, in digital documentation and shared this out with everybody so that every single person involved in the squad had this. And so what we did next was idea generation. And this is where we started getting a little creative. So the leads of the squad and anybody else who wanted to partic participate, and I felt that this is always really important to, to keep this open to everybody who wants to join in, we brainstormed. <clears throat> we came up with uh, what are the features that we think customers are going to want in the big picture product that we end up shipping, not just the MVP. And uh, 
they were everything from like pie in the sky and moonshot ideas all the way down to little tiny feature improvements. And this was um, irrespective of deadline or business constraints. I mean, this is just purely creative brainstorming. So we brainstormed on ideas. At the same time, we also did a bit of a competitive market analysis. We, we looked at what other, other sites are doing and what expected user behavior is and offerings. Um, and then we also had some online interviews. We reached out to customers. We polled them on what their expectations are of using features like this in the marketplace, what they like to see, what they don't like to see, what kind of things bother them, what, what do they really like about certain sites. And we compiled all this information together onto even more sticky notes. And we had an effort and value session. So this was the second large session where we had stakeholders, we had engineers, we had designers, the whole team. And in the effort and value session, what we did was we took all of these ideas and points, and we took the sticky notes, I pulled them off the paper, held it up, and said, okay, what do we think about this feature? And what I had done was I had uh, drawn a graph on the window behind us. We don't, have, we don't have walls that are good for putting sticky notes on in the office. Um, Geograph. And the graph was on the y-axis, you had customer value, right, uh, low to high. And then on the x-axis, you had effort from low to high. And so what we did was we went through each one of these sticky notes quickly, um, and that was on purpose so that people could kind of do this from their gut without overthinking things. And we asked the group to decide what the effort and value of each feature would be, regardless of whether we're going to ship it or not. And this was really, really interesting because having the stakeholders in this meeting with the engineers and with the designers, uh, what was really surprising to me was that they were very aligned, probably 95% of everything that we talked about and put on the wall, everybody agreed where it should go. And there were a couple sticking points, and we discussed those, put them where we thought. But um, that was when the empathy as a team <clears throat> and for each other was starting to become apparent, and for the customer. So this is what we ended up with. This is one of two charts that we had. And you can see, so over to the right is going to be higher effort, and higher up is going to be higher value. And it immediately became apparent to the team when they were looking at a list of features and ideas that there are some things that, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a lot of effort and it's probably not going to provide a lot of customer value based on the customer interviews that we've seen or other things that we've seen online and just kind of our own, our own hunch. And then you have things in the top right, which while they might be really high customer value and it might be really, really great to get this into a, to a final version of a product, it's going to be really high effort. And if we're looking at a tight deadline and we want to ship an MVP that's going to deliver value, we probably don't want to be focusing there. We probably want to be focusing in the top left. And that's kind of the sweet spot of ideas where we've, we've um, agreed as a group that this is very low effort and very high value. And so I took a lot of these ideas and kind of mixed them with some of the features that we absolutely knew we had to have because of the requirements from the business and digitized those, created another matrix, shared that out. And now we had a working document of ideas that we think are going to be useful to the customer. So then we started our prototyping phase. And typically, you know, with, as with other prototyping phases, the, the designer created a couple prototypes. And it was based off of our findings from users, competitive market analysis, and our effort value session. Created one that was very similar to the way we structure our website today and the types of offering that we have now, our, our, our UX language. And then he created another style that was a total departure, um, total pie in the sky, like what if we surface products like this? And let's just put this out in, in front of customers and, and see what it does. I mean, no, no harm, no foul. So we put it out there. Uh, we did online user testing for all of these because we were under such a tight, tight deadline. And when we got the results back, we synthesized them. And we didn't just immediately go into the next round of prototyping. What we did from there was we had a playback session. And the playback session was an extremely important step as well in building empathy and consensus with not only the squad, because they're, they're pretty bought in at this point, but with the larger team, um, our in-house marketing agency, um, our customer service team, um, all other departments that are loosely connected or, or touch this project in other ways were able to come to these playback sessions. And we had a presentation showing our findings. We recapped the analysis, market analysis that we did. We recapped the effort value session, and we recapped the prototype findings. And we were able to have a discussion about this. And people 
really for the first time in the way that we've been building products, because we generally build very fast, we were able to kind of slow down a little bit and increase the buy-in and the ownership of everybody involved in the understanding, the empathy for both the customer needs and the business in this, in this project. So we did that, that was phase one. <clears throat> we did another round of prototypes and then we did the same thing. It was kind of rinse and repeat. Round two, the prototypes were kind of honing in a little bit more, a little bit more polished. We kind of had an idea of the direction we were gonna go. Round three was just kind of playing with a few different UX flows or maybe some buttons here, buttons there things like that. Um, and so once the third round, of, sorry, and we also had playbacks in between each one of these. So all the extended stakeholders in the larger business were kept in the loop as we went through this, through this process. I felt it was really important for them to know how we were making, uh, what decisions we were making and why, and how the product that we're ultimately going to ship or plan to ship um, took shape. So once we had that, we set up a, a set of final requirements that we knew we were going to try and deliver. And because of all the pre-planning and the pre-work that we had done, I feel that the MVP we created was able to take a lot of the kind of smaller features that may not have been a lot of work, but customers had told us will provide value either emotionally or for, their, for the usability of the future instead of just delivering the high level requirements of as a user, I must be able to do this. So we started building and everybody was in lockstep. At this point when we started building, we were a little bit behind schedule. There were some competing business priorities that were unfortunately out of our hands that we had to deal with. Um, so we got started a little later than we, we had hoped. But I believe that as a result of this entire uh, pre-planning and pre-work process, the engineers were working in lockstep and they were moving quickly. And there was very little back and forth. Why did we make this decision again? What did we say we were gonna build? Why are we doing this? Nobody was telling me that deadlines are just arbitrary anymore, which was a big win. Um, <clears throat> and then fast forward a couple weeks and we hit the inevitable. We had to start descoping. And, <laughs> and of course, like this is, this is gonna happen no matter where you work. You're gonna have to descope for whatever reason. Um, and historically, a lot of the times when we descope, it's because we are close to the delivery of a project and we have not built all the core functionality. We have to cut what we have to cut because we can't, just can't deliver in time. And so sometimes this leads to building kind of hacky solutions where you can, you can ultimately deliver the functionality, but you're going to incur so much tech debt and you may not actually be able to come back and fix this tech debt once you've shipped it. You might just go on to the next feature. And then this builds and builds and builds until eventually you are, you're slow doing whatever you're trying to do. So this time there was a bit of a silver lining and we had the descoping conversation much earlier than we normally do. Um, because of our pre-planning, we knew where we were headed, we knew what was coming up and we were able to start talking about things that we needed to cut before we were up against the deadline and we had to scramble. Um, so that's, I attribute a really big win to this process, being able to have these conversations much earlier. And the things that we ended up cutting, well, we still had to do a little bit of the functionality cutting and, and a little bit of hacking to kind of figure things out. It was significantly less than the way we normally operate, which I think is, is still a huge, huge, huge win. And the engineers were much more appreciative of this. Everybody understood why we were cutting the things we were cutting. We were able to make decisions as a team. The stakeholders were able to understand. We didn't have to have these long meetings explaining like, oh, but we promise, you know, if we cut this, then you're still going to have this functionality. You didn't have that kind of bartering going on where it's like, okay, we'll make compromises for this, but not that. Like everything was, was very lockstep, which was really fantastic. And today we're still building. <clears throat> We've cut the, the descoping phase, or I should say we finished the descoping phase, we're not doing that anymore. We're about a week away from launch and things have been going well. Actually, we are ahead of schedule that we thought we would be, which is always nice. And the conversations are much less stressful than they have been in the past. Um, so it's great. Oops. So kind of in conclusion to this whole process, I mean, the things that I've really taken away from this that I wanted to share today is that in this process, we've really noticed a huge increase in buy-in. Buy-in from the engineers um, for the deadlines and the KPIs, 
buy-in from the stakeholders as to why we can't do certain things in a certain amount of time and, and from the larger business. And in increasing the buy-in of everybody involved, I've also noticed a huge increase in ownership. And this one is really key to me because when somebody is really, when they feel like they're an owner of something that they're shipping, because they are, because they are the ones who built this and created this, there's, there's an aligned vision, right? And when you have an aligned vision, you can let people go and do their best work and people can work from home and they don't necessarily have to be checked in on all the time and you trust that they're gonna deliver what they need to deliver in time because they're totally bought in. And that also has decreased the, the back and forth, right? As I said, people are able to kind of go. And ultimately, I feel that these lead to a successful MVP. And while we still have yet to test it, I'm confident that what we did was the right process for us at the right time on the right project. And I'm super excited to see what it's going to do in the wild. Um, so hopefully some of what I shared today will be useful in, in your day-to-day -day or maybe on your next big project. And I'd love to talk to you guys about it later today. Thanks.